speak um, front of you this evening, especially with this subject which is very close to my heart, if I may say so. Uh, for this conference, this lecture is just a kind of addendum to um, main research I, I published in the form of a book last year about what I call the county prayer, that is a like way of praying with beads counting the prayers, numbers. And um, if I may add this as an introduction, this personal uh, anecdote, I started this uh, study 40 years ago when I was a child and uh, because my mother went in a shop to buy for a First Communion one of these rosaries. And I was so puzzled to see the numbers. Why were there 50 bees and why were they arranged this way? I started collecting them, which I did for several years, and that was the only way to study this very interesting, I think, uh, practice of the county prayer, which is probably the most um, idiosyncratic practice of devotion for lay people in the West, in Christianity, as would be icon worship for Orthodox, the repeated prayer would be the thing for lay people, and especially because it's not as a devotion for, uh, I speak, obviously after Reformation for Catholic people and for pre-Reformation, pre excuse me, for all um, uh, ways in Christianity, but it was not very well um, uh, viewed by the church who tried to organize it, but it, it sprang from other places. It's not a kind of state program thing like would be the worship of the Holy Sacrament, for instance, would be a kind of um, uh, imposed devotion on the people. But this county prayer was something which just happened and had to be organized. So, um, my purpose tonight is not to discuss this very wide subject, but just to, as a, say, a kind of addendum to this work, to see its relationship uh, to um, the early portraiture in uh, Renaissance uh, Europe. And it's quite astonishing, at least to me, that so many of these sitters are displayed fondling or touching bees for quite a short period of um, a painting, which is almost the time where uh, portraiture, individual portraiture emerges in Western art and is um, spreading uh, among all uh, so social uh, classes. So this is just early and very beautiful example by um, Van der Weyden in Anne, showing Philippe de Croix with his uh, beads between his hands and uh, of course it's not strictly speaking an independent portrait that is it was probably part of the diptych that is what's called <coughs> of the Biden now assuming uh, it's in uh, San Marino uh, collection but nevertheless the fact that he's praying not just with a gesture but with beads is doesn't change anything to my uh, purpose and uh, in fact it's one of the commonest uh, type of portrait in uh, 15 late 15th century and 16th uh, century painting just to show you a few examples because we hardly uh, look at those things in the hands of the sitters when we see this painting which is because it's only a small object but its present must be meaningful and that's the uh, purpose of my lecture tonight so by Chosan Clair, uh, by Anguy Sola, and Dürer, and other, and other anonymous painters. It's not my purpose to discuss uh, really the merits of this portrait. You, you see, this is a very interesting arrangement because it's kind of predictive, but there is no uh, figure of devotion to be related to. There's no virgin or saint, but they are only portrait of a couple, as a couple in history, I would say, in time, and I will come back uh, to that later. You see our example, the other father with um, beads. And the um, uh, question is, what may be the relationship of uh, 
maybe I could like this one which is less puzzling <laughs> with what I'm saying right now. Um, the question of this apparition of uh, modern portrait, that is to say the, the purpose of preserving the lineaments, the appearance of a mortal man, which is a kind of new concern, especially as it's not in a kind of abstract and generalized way as it would be in sculpture or in metal, for instance, where it's kind of memory. But when it's so realistic, and especially because of a costume which is so present, the attention to dress, which links the scissor obviously to a special moment of his own life, of fashion, so something very uh, concrete and very fugitive in time, not in this kind of long duration like would be like a portrait medal would be, which is kind of timeless, but something and, and the attention of putting always the age of the sitter and not even his name, which is quite uh, I would say uh, aggravating to us to, have, to know he was like 20, uh, uh, 24 or 83 and we don't know his name and we don't know the painter but who would know that? So it's very strange that this um, desire to to keep this image of a living man who will die someday, will disappear, and his memory maybe will fade also, is so rooted into this frailty of the instant. And there is some kind of paradox really tell very much about what Western culture is. Uh, anyway, uh, the presence. Uh, at this very period of the creation and the early development of the portraits in Western culture, the presence of this very object must tell us something about what these portraits are meaning, what these people, these people would like to have their um, personal appearance recorded with these objects in their hands, as they were not, if you want to uh, prove your devotion, they could be obvious answer, you just pay for something, you pay to be, uh, for a nice scalis or vestment or uh, something to be done, not to have your own picture made at your expense to show yourself your own piety, it's not working this way. So um, to take a simile, um, uh, I've chosen this um, very famous uh, portrait of Jean-Marc Natier showing Madame Adelaide making knots because she's holding, or it's a kind of the same process of object working as paregon in the painting, as something which is there and which is a kind of commentary on the whole uh, project, uh, both ethical and aesthetical. And she is making knots, you see, with this kind of small object we call in French navet, which is a, a, an actual object which is copied on a loom uh, shuttle, and it was device for ladies not to be idle in society. So it had no function than to show the working hands of a lady, which was a way of putting them to advantage, obviously, and also to show that a lady should never even remain idle, even if she's conversing. So lady would, ladies would have these golden shuttles with thread, and were making knots. And there are many, many portraits of, uh, in a, within a, a small period of time of these ladies making knots. And finally enough, uh, they, they were making a kind of lace of it, a very ugly and pointless lace, which was called frivolité. <coughs> so <laughs> it was this mixture of um, pleasure and subtle um, ethical uh, be social behavior for women. So uh, to uh, go back to our uh, Tied to our subject, the um, question of counting prayers with bees. What is the purpose of uh, counting? Why repeating something you've said before? It's uh, repetition is a counter value, even in scripture. And in Matthew, we say, Why are you repeating always the same thing like pagans do? And at best, it's supposed to be like a kind of Cytacism, and at worst it looks like magical practice, you know, to enforce things to happen by repeating, by the power of the mere power of, of, of words. So, repetition is not in, in such a very positive. Uh, 
we have to look for a reason for that in the early Christian practice to recite the 150 psalms every day. So this psalm you have or to read them or to know them by heart, which was anyway a very <coughs> tedious and long process, which obviously was not open to anybody. So uh, in monastic rule, for instance, they started to change this um, praying with psalm with the 150 psalms every day to the repetition of something 150 times, like O oh Father, 150 times, and especially for penances purposes, uh, because in early church penances were like uh, five years fasting or very very heavy penances, and they were commuted to this kind of repetitive uh, prayer. Uh, at the very beginning, only the All Father, uh, the Pater Noster, was concerned with this practice. But when the Hail Mary became a more common prayer during the 18th uh, century, uh, it tended to be also repeated this uh, way. And we have to think that the Hail Mary in this period had not what we call the second part. It was only the first part with the words uh, of the angel and the greeting of uh, Elizabeth. And there was not the second part of the praying for us uh, at the time of death, and etc. So it was a much shorter and simpler uh, prayer than it is uh, now. So uh, this repetition is not only about performing something as would be the perpetual prayer of the Orthodox, where we pray all the time but without counting. Here there is a purpose of achieving something by uh, calculation and once you're finished it composes something new which is the completion of what they call for instance in 13th century the Psalter of All Lady, like there was the Psalter of All Lord which are the actual Psalms of David and the Ancient Testament and there was this new uh, Psalter of All Lady composed only of 150 Hail uh, Mary. Uh, this way of composing uh, something complete and perfect in its way with small elements, which is exactly what beats or knots uh, are, completing a certain number of things, was almost immediately compared to uh, flowers. Because flowers are the most <coughs> accessible of offerings. It's something both very beautiful, very precious, and anybody can get, especially the rose, which is like a perfect flower in medieval times. So there would be a connection made between this flower offered to the shrine and the prayer being itself a flower. And of course, these flowers composed together would make not a nosegay, as we would suppose, but what uh, was um, something more akin to the social practice of the time, a crown to be put on the head of the beloved one. So there is plenty of evidence about uh, this, I think you know perfectly of, of this um, uh, courteous way of uh, waving or plating uh, crowns with flowers. This is an example from Boccaccio, a uh, very beautiful manuscript illuminated by Barthélémy Tech in Vienna. And you see she, she is just um, thinking of our beloved one and uh, braiding this crown of flowers. So people praying were making the same thing on a spiritual level, preparing with all these single prayers a spiritual crown to be offered to the Virgin as a, to a token of love and devotion, as would, as would do the, uh, <coughs> the gallant knight to his lady. And you can see this is an earlier example of 14th century um, to the manuscript showing uh, how the lady is rewarding the knight with a crown of flowers. So it, it was really something quite, uh, not only symbolic, but quite common because we know there were corporations of people making these crowns to be sold in the street and they were bought and uh, given uh, between people as uh, a token of love, as would flowers in shape of bouquet uh, um, 
probably uh, today. But there is one aspect which is very important to me in this, uh, in, in this birth of a modern rosary. Rosary, by the way, is just coming from the idea of the roses, obviously, and means a garden or a crown of uh, roses. It is the idea of exchange, of something given and something given back. Be it love and the crown being a token one of the uh, other. And this, uh, this uh, exchange, for instance, is quite um, obvious in the great um, uh, altarpiece by Albert Schiller in Vienna, the Feast of the Rosary, where you see here that it's the, the, the child and the virgin who are placing crowns, roses, crowns on the head on, of the people around them. So the offering goes both ways, and there are many tales and legends about apparition of a virgin uh, crowning with flowers, uh, one of her devotees who, were, who was praying to her, and this kind of, of, of story. So there is this um, idea of exchanging gifts and getting some reward out of this practice, which we see later is quite important. So, uh, of course, as we can notice quite easily, uh, the sweetness of uh, heavenly devotion goes willingly with the pleasure of uh, possession of nice objects. So, uh, maybe one of the nicest things we have in projects in, in late medieval and early Renaissance art are related to this uh, both devotion but taste of beautiful artifacts which are hardly needed, strictly speaking, if you just want to count on knots, on seeds, on people, as the early example I, I, I shown uh, earlier. So usually these beads to count your prayers uh, are made of coral, of hard stones, of rock crystal, uh, precious metal, and so on, and in this way uh, belong to the dress and to the costume, as with any kind of jewel. And that's also maybe how they, one of the ways they came into portrait as being part of fashion in uh, uh, some way. Uh, it's quite remarkable that uh, the separations, which makes the difference between an ordinary necklace and beads to count prayer, rosaries, or, or, or of a kind, are, uh, the, the species are called uh, gaudies, or things for fun, uh, which are not uh, used for counting but for separating, so exactly like in any calculating uh, device, and they could be of um, practical order just to make this division, but also be any kind of thing you, uh, as the thing people are putting on their phones or on their keyring before, so just or bracelets, just funny mementos, small relics, medals you know, from pilgrimage, uh, anything. And I would like to um, uh, show some example of a very nice uh, object where you can see that it's uh, obviously hardly required to have such uh, heavily and fragile object to say your uh, prayers on uh, so that to legislatively um, uh, put on more like pattern rosters than uh, rosaries in uh, Munich and one in the Louvre <coughs> in rock crystal which is painted inside with small scenes which are hardly visible so it's not a question to be able to use them during praying and you can see that interesting in those three examples is that they still have a ring so it was something almost like the Greek uh, modern cobbler, something you would have in your finger and just play with and be with during the day whether you were counting actually or uh, not. So I would like to uh, open a small parenthesis about one of uh, these objects you may add on your beads uh, as part of this <coughs> Gaudi, as this uh, uh, object you may uh, enrich with your, your beads, 
those are the details of the same portrait I've shown uh, before. And there, there are the small um, balls made of filigree in, in, in gold or in silver, which are we call them in, in French as in German. I believe go by the name of pomander, which means they're a kind of small box uh, meant to contain uh, amber, amber grease, meaning amber grease from the well or musk or any kind of scented material which was supposed to give a nice perfume to the hand, especially to the gloves people were wearing all the time, and was supposed to have also uh, healthy properties, like preventing to get contaminated by uh, sicknesses or epidemies or, or the like. And certainly uh, it was nice to have handy a source of good smell around you at any time, in any circumstances. So it's interesting to see that this very mundane object as a pomander is associated as part of the dress to uh, the, the, the beads of the rosary. These are two examples of uh, Flemish pomanders, quite similar to the one you see in the, in the paintings. And uh, just to show you some examples of them, they, uh, some of them have small compartments to put um, perfume into it. Most of them it's, uh, it's uh, amber grease. And uh, see this famous portrait of Titian showing the young Clarice Astrozzi with on her belt this uh, pomander here. It was especially important to have children carrying them because we're supposed to prevent them from getting sick or all kind of prophylactic uh, values. So, um, <coughs> uh, there's a kind of back and forth um, uh, movement between um, profanity or mundane things and, and sacred things in this object because you see the they're meant to count prayers, but they're made of precious materials which are, uh, they are carried around are like jewels. And the same thing happened with the commanders, which are their kind of um, religious or spiritual counterpart in these mock commanders made of boxwood. And I, I, I bring this point because there's been a very interesting um, exhibition last year in Amsterdam uh, coming from. Toronto and New York before about all this micro sculpture in Boxwood. But I think they missed the point uh, of the reason being of these objects. And uh, it is to be uh, found, uh, for instance, in the 16th century sources, uh, when they are described, uh, sorry, I should show you this before. So you see, uh, outwardly, they are exactly like. Silver pomander with the same kind of ajouré uh, open uh, open work uh, or filigree work, but made in wood, like an imitation of something because this could be also in metal, but it's not. And inside, when you open it, you discover, but you know these objects, all this uh, incredible miniaturized uh, representation of uh, salvation. So it's usually what is the most uh, difficult and uh, um, how to say it, uh, most impossible thing to show is uh, the last judgment, and that's usually what they represent in the small, this very small, tiny object with all these figures. So there is a kind of vertigo of opening this small, this small nut and finding inside the whole story of the world and beyond told within this small object. Like, when you open your commander, you have all this uh, uh, perfume bringing with it uh, health and preservation from uh, death. And then you open this and you have just the same thing, but it's not, it has no sense, but brings to your senses, your sight, in inoculants, all this wealth, uh, spiritual wealth which will ensure your spiritual health in some way. 
And uh, I want to, to, to quote a few texts. The first is uh, what, what, how I started to understand better the subject. It's, it's um, Dictionnaire des Écrivains Français, um, uh, written by Antoine Duverdier in Lyon in the 16th century. And he, it's about a note he makes of a translator, uh, Martin Fleury, who translated uh, the Proverbs of Erasmus. And that's what he says in, uh, so in 1544, which is uh, just the time this object were made and, and used. I read it in French and then I give a translation of uh, Erasmus in English. Les Silènes d'Alcibiade d'Erasme, qui est un proverbe anciennement usité des Grecs, duquel on se pourra aider à propos, lorsque sous vanité et folie apparente de prime face, une chose se manifestera excellente. Et été Silène, Petites images taillées et façonnées. Ces choses fermées montraient la figure d'une trompette, cornée ou toute autre ridicule forme, mais à l'ouverture, il paraissait chose divine et miraculeuse. So, um, I, I will after the, the original in Erasmus, but the idea is that you have this object with a kind of stupid outside appearance, like was Silenus, and not Silenus himself, but so Socrates. And as he had compared in Plato's banquet, Socrates to Silenus because he's so ugly outside and he's so such a spiritual man inside. So that's what the 14th Erasmus thought, and then in the 16th century, that you have this kind of uh, uh, mountain object, and inside you have all this display of uh, faith and wisdom and uh, salvation. And actually, some objects of this period are exactly what are described into, uh, by um, Erasmus, as we shall see, like this pod piece, because they look like a pod inside a piece, which look like beads actually, uh, somehow, uh, open themselves, and in them you have saints or uh, small scenes of, uh, from the scriptures. So it's exactly what is described uh, by uh, this um, uh, Silene Alcibiadis. So this is the most popular, maybe, of um, the proverb of Erasmus, was published in um, 1515. And it, it opens with uh, Plato's banquet. And I found an early English translation of the text I would like to share with you. Uh, this saying among learned man, men is taken from a proverb which uh, may conveniently be used either for a thing which uh, outwardly, and as they say at the first flush, seems to be of no value and scornful. Yet, yet if a man look nearer to it and behold it in wider part, it appeareth great and wonderful. Some say that Sileni wear certain images, carven and graven, that and made after such a fashion that they might be opened and closed again, which when they were closed, had a scornful and monstrous shape, and when they were opened suddenly, they should as gods. <coughs> this fashion and images was taken of a scorned Silen and Silenus, sold master to bakers. Moreover, at Alcibiades, going about to praise Socrates, when he dined with Plato, did liken him to such manner image. And Erasmus, after comparing Jesus Christ to uh, Silenus as being a, a god with a mere man appearance, concludes like this. Now may we also find many such images in the sacrament of the church. Thou seest the water, thou seest the oil and salt, thou hearest the words, that is, but the outward, outward party of the image, for if thou never hear nor see the heavenly strength and their true sent from above into the inner parties of these images, all the residue, or no other things, be but very trifle and of no value. The Holy Scripture hath also such images, if thou stay in it the utter party, the matter is often vile and scornful, but if you search the inner party for short wonder and reverence the goodly wisdom. So it's interesting to see for it 
seems to be a uh, parenthesis for this question, this question um, looming around this subject about the difficult relationship of or, or embodiment of the spiritual into objects and how we go, as I said, back and forth to profane, to um, religious and to religious to, uh, to uh, mundane. So, uh, to, uh, uh, to conclude, what happened in the period uh, we're uh, concentrating uh, on is uh, at the very time of this appearance of um, portraiture uh, in Europe, that was the time where the recitation of Cantic Prayer was standardized and um, with rules by the Dominicans, uh, and namely Alain de la Roche, quite a fearful uh, figure, and who wrote also with the Schranger, the Maleus Maleficao, you know, the treaties against witches. And so he claimed to have uh, personal visions uh, by which he knew that the rosary was not something coming from, you know, this very ancient practice of uh, anachronics and Hermits in the desert, we know where it uh, was, but it was given as a tool against the uh, Albigeois heresy by the Virgin to uh, Saint Dominic himself. And so the Dominican decided that all this piety, which is which is there around, you know, uh, practiced by uh, everybody, was something belonging to them, and they got the authorization to ground the country of the Rosary, which was the only one. Uh, with the right to uh, uh, organize uh, public recitation of the rosary. What was the uh, uh, two main points of this organization? The first is, is to fight the idea that this repetition was a bit um, pointless. You had to meditate on a set of 15 episodes of the life of the Christ and the Virgin, which are called mysteries. And this 15 mysteries that are divided in five sets of uh, joyous, sorrowful, and glorious. And you have a wide iconography, I just showed you this Lorenzo Lotto uh, painting with the 15 mysteries organized in rows, in shape of, in circle, of course, because they are like beads. So all this kind of mandala uh, looking uh, pictures because it explains how it works. You say your beads according to the scheme of the mysteries you're going through, and then uh, down you see the uh, Virgin giving the rosary to the to Saint Dominic and other saint. That's beside the point. And the, the angel scattering uh, rose petals. You know, so all these associations I uh, was referring to before. But what is the point of following strictly? Uh, the requirement of the conferring of the rosary is because we, you gain a wealth of indulgences. And that was a great success of this particular devotion is that if you follow strictly all this accounting uh, scheme of doing, and of course not only reciting the given number of prayers, but also uh, being confessed, uh, having taken uh, <coughs> communion and, and some other requirement, you could get partial or complete indulgence for the living and the dead, which was uh, incredible because for the living you could still hope you will mend your ways in the future, but be able to do something for the dead and to alleviate the suffering of souls in purgatory was an amazing um, possibility. So obviously it, it, it was such a um, comfort, I mean, Everybody would do that, start praying and accumulating um, uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of years of remission because nobody knows how long it's going to last in purgatory. So, you, some devotion you could get as far as 50,000 years of, of your balance of purgatory time, uh, which was abolished in 19th century, this too high level indulgence. But they still exist in, in Catholic uh, theology. So, 
Uh, this is exactly the period where a reformation will start, and we start because of this entertainment business and all this uh, money uh, raising for the new syndicate in Germany, especially. So um, all this, you see, is clearly uh, inter interconnected. I show you the last example of this uh, system, which is quite uh, eloquent, I think. Where this uh, small, um, some leaf, a central leaf of this rosary triptych in Madrid. And you see here how through the marriage of Christ, because all the capacity of the church to give it indulgences is through the infinite merits of Christ, which can redeem any debt from anybody. But the church is the banker of this treasure, it's called the church treasure, treasure actually. So you see the sacrifice of Christ in the center, the crown, the crown of roses, but set in as a rosary in in, by ten, separated by Gaudis, and you see the release of the souls from purgatory through this kind of um, mechanism, almost, by the system. So, I think, um, to conclude, when we see this uh, modern man, this very self-conscious man, wanted to have this um, to leave a track in history, not a track only uh, with his good name or with his deed, like the people we knew from antiquity, for which um, we were craving to find portraits of the great men, but only for emperors we had them, but for great philosophers we are so difficult to, great writers we hardly know their physical appearance. So there is this consciousness of wanting more from memory than just leaving uh, a, a name or uh, works and to have to add uh, beads to this this enterprise, this uh, project of leaving a track of uh, one step is saying more. I think about the the sitter is uh, stating something about the, the concern of one spiritual afterlife. Of course, and you take in charge your own uh, soul in a very responsible way because you're going to accumulate this wealth for your, yourself no, and not only for yourself because as you can pray for the deceased one which is maybe the most fascinating part of a uh, devotion it means also you belong to a lineage that you are responsible towards your, the people before you and that's also something to leave to, for people after you to show how you pray yourself for your fathers, grandfathers, ancestors, and as an admonition to your descendant to do, uh, to do uh, the, uh, the, the same. And of course it would be too simple just to see them as mere accessory of fashion, speaking of status, of luxury, and maybe as we could see them. But uh, I think uh, in a way, and it, it can't be very affirmative way of saying things by the lack of concrete source, but by bringing this kind of net of signification, I think we can bring um, a sense of what it can be, uh, what can be the meaning of this uh, use so common of rosary in the hands of sitters in um, in the Renaissance uh, portraiture as another way also to inscribe in individual life into a wider span of time, uh, collective time, and probably also to keep uh, eternity at bay. Thank you.